All right, guys, what's up? Welcome to the 111th installment of the Unplugged Alpha podcast series. Tonight, we're talking about entrepreneurship. Last week, we were talking about uh, careers that will net you some wealth in your life. So it uh, seemed like a popular topic. Wanted to uh, dive right into this one and talk about ways of making money that don't involve working for somebody else and lining their pocket with gold. Um, first of all, apologies for kicking it off a little bit late. I had to uh, pick up... Uh, Steve from accounting. <laughs> you can't you can't see him. He's a non. He's uh, he's my editor. We have to do some audio work on um, the uh, the second edition and do some uh, touch ups on the follow up book. So he's helping me here with the audio audio recording. So that's why we're a little bit later tonight. But uh, the topic of entrepreneurship. Look, guys, you know it's a favorite for me. Obviously, you know this is the name of the channel, the name of the original channel entrepreneurs and cars, you know, the idea was really to interview uh, entrepreneurs and their success rides. They tell their stories about the trials and tribulations. We ended up going through like five episodes. So if you want to like go back to really old stuff from 2014, we're talking 10 years ago now, um, go have a look. And, you know, you see some of the conversations that, you know, I got tied up in, but um, I've always had a direct connection with guys that have the gumption, the skill sets, the drive to get a business off the ground. Um, it is one of the most rewarding things you're ever going to do. Uh, and that is inclusive of having children. I mean, anybody can have children, you know, you just do your thing and you walk away and they come nine months later, right? Uh, creating a business is something unique and special and it gives you a degree of control and how can I put this, man? It's just, it's just a, it's just a level of, of something that you don't get in school. It's just a level of something that you get that you don't get when you're checking in at a, a corporate gig, you know, uh, job J O B it's an acronym. I've said this before for just over broke. Um, the, the system, you can call it whatever you want, man, the system, the matrix, whatever it happens to be is designed to keep you enslaved at a point where you're not wealthy, but you're not so poor that you're living on the street. You got enough money to have a car, to get around if you need it, or access to transit or a monthly bus pass or whatever it happens to be. You got food in your fridge. You got a roof over your head. You got a warm bed at night. And they set you up that way. And sometimes, you know, guys get pissed off, right? Like I had this guy that shot me an email the other day and he's like, well, what are you going to do if uh, you have a heart attack, right? It's like, you know, you shouldn't be shitting on the working man. Well, first of all, the chance of me ha having a heart attack is so fucking remote and slim because the way that I take care of my health, but I'll set that aside. But yeah, the value of the guy that is working at the fire station, the ambulances, the hospitals, the like the working guys, I don't I don't ever shit on those guys, man. I got the utmost respect for them. Some of my closest friends in my community here in the GTA are trades guys, right? Electricians, welders, you know, things like that. They're they're the ones that build the infrastructure that we get to enjoy, right? Like fancy spiral wrought iron staircases. You know, you need to get your hot tub wired. You need an electrician to come over and plug it into your fuse panel and wire it down to your tub, right? These things don't happen by themselves, and I certainly don't do them. But there's a lot of opportunities even in those spaces. Like I've got, I've got guys that that are willing to have conversations around. Hey, look, you know, you can make a couple hundred thousand dollars a year in the trades. I get it. There's there's fewer and fewer people moving in those spaces. When I had to get my dishwasher installed here, I called up a family friend to come and do it. And he's related to a gal that, uh, I mean, I'm calling a family friend, but he's related to a gal that my brother used to date. And it's like, you know, he comes over, what's the price? Buck 25, you know, whatever it happens to be from screwing a couple things, give him a fat tip, send him off home, shake hands, hug, you know, see you later sort of thing. Yeah, they have value. I'm not saying that they don't, but what I'm saying is if you want to produce extraordinary freedom and wealth, then entrepreneurship is the only path. Um, you know, like I mentioned last week when I was recapping, you know, we had um, C-suite jobs, uh, licensed legal, sorry, licensed professionals, which includes licensed legal professionals, surgeons, doctors, accountants, stuff like that, uh, licensed to uh, buy and sell, uh, you know, financial instruments, anything that's in the licensed legal uh, realm. Uh, the third one was uh, what I call being able to command an audience, right? Uh, actors, musicians, athletes, even influencers, you know, people laugh at these because it's like, you don't really think about it, but 
when you see people that are sports fanatics, they will go and spend hundreds and, you know, sometimes thousands of dollars every few months on their favorite team, on paraphernalia, on clothing, on jerseys, expensive jerseys with another man's name written on their back. They'll even buy a jersey with another man's name written on the back of it and give it to their girlfriend or wife. This is how fastidious they are about these uh, sports teams and these athletes. And they command an audience, you know, when when they say, hey, you know, I'm affiliated with this shoe company or, or this apparel company, people buy it, right? So, you know, there's value in that brand and that's how they create that immense wealth. High ticket sales, you know, is another one. Selling anything, jets, uh, you know, yachts, private, uh, anything, like anything that's a percentage of a high dollar value, you know, cost 10 million. Great. Cost a hundred million, even better. You're getting a percentage of that. Uh, I'm sure whoever's selling G seven jets now, or, you know, whatever happens to be the hot ticket for, you know, for that market, it's probably making uh, fat stacks of cash. And then we also talked about STEM last week as well. Science, technology, engineering, maths, you know, you're working on rockets for Elon Musk or you're programming code for, one of the fang companies, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, um, you know, those uh, groups of companies, you can all make a lot of money in those spaces, but they have some downsides. And just to recap last week, because these downsides don't generally exist in the realm of entrepreneurship and the school of entrepreneurship, which is my flagship course is open for enrollment this week. Uh, it actually officially opens November 1st, but I put it in the description of this video. So it's available to uh, grab now if you want to pick it up uh, before the official launch. But um, the thing with entrepreneurship is we all saw what happened a couple of years ago, you know, with the scamdemic where they said, wear this phase diaper, stand on this dot. Oh, by the way, it's time for you to take our experimental uh, jab. We're not sure if it's going to work, but we're pretty sure it's safe and effective, you know, three months into building this thing out. And I had a lot of people at that time that were like, look, man, been watching your stuff. I understand your views and your take. I'm I'm in the same you know camp as you. But if I don't take this thing, I'm going to lose my job, and I have a mortgage to pay, and you know like a wife and children to take care of in my house. So what do I do? And the vast majority of these guys that didn't have options, that were a slave to the corporate grind. It didn't matter if it was C-suite jobs. It didn't matter if it was a licensed professional that was working in a hospital, in an accounting firm in a financial instrument type of office type of thing. It didn't matter any of those things. If the mandate existed and it came down from corporate, down the ladder, you know, sort of thing, then you had to do it. You could have been making, you know, five, $600,000 a year, making great money for a company. And then all of a sudden they said, oh, by the way, you need to do this, okay? And that's not something that exists in the realm of entrepreneurship. You don't have that obligation, you know? Um, in fact, a lot of friends of mine that run companies, they didn't even mandate anything because it was just a recommendation. And it's only like these large corps that, and they're in bed with the government, okay? I mean, I've talked before about my lobbying efforts and the collusion between uh, government, financial institutions, and how they work together very clearly to their interests. You know, a lot of people think, oh, the government's all there to take care of us and look after us and all of those things. And it's like, dive a little deeper down the rabbit hole, my friend. There is something to learn there. There's a lot more going on than what you think. So back to the notion of the entrepreneurship, you have that flexible flexibility and freedom. Let me tell you a story about my buddy, Adrian. So he was living in Ottawa a few years ago when this thing kicked off. And he had a facility in uh, the States. And his partner worked down there and he worked up in uh, Canada. They, you know, they met up, uh, you know, once a month and did their thing. And then he started seeing what was happening with mandates, standing on dots, wearing face diapers. And then what was coming over the horizon after that, which was going to be take our experimental uh, Jabba juice. And he said, you know what? I'm out. He sold everything. He had a location independent business that he could run from anywhere in the world that didn't rely on a storefront an op a neon open sign or any of that, any of those things, packed his bags, sold his G-Wagon, sold his condo, took his girlfriend, dogs. They went down south and they started investing in Mexican real estate. And they've been doing quite well. Um, when you have your life structured in such a way that you don't have to become an obedient, compliant, hey, jump, okay, master, how high, right? 
when you've got your life structured in such a way where you've got mobility and you've got freedom to maneuver and you can act on it, that's something to be said. And you can make a lot of money too. Um, there's no, I mean, I don't like to emphasize the notion of get rich quick, but there's no more rapid path route to financial success and growth than entrepreneurship. I think I still have it down here actually. Yeah, I do. It was, um, what's the date on this? So this is January 19th, 2009. And I incorporated my business, the debt relief business that I started up in the early 2000s, uh, five years before this. And this wasn't the first time that we got recognized for hypergrowth, right? So, you, I mean, it's going to be hard for you to see the date on that. But you can see this is the business section of the Toronto Star. And that's me over there. And the headline is Saving People Drowning in a Sea of Debt. That was in our old office in um, Markham. And that was the third time that the company got awarded for hypergrowth, which meant we were doing over 100% growth year over year. So without emphasizing too much the rapid path to making a lot of money and generating a lot of receivables and sales receipts, and if you set it up correctly, profit as well, without banging on that drum too much, it's part and parcel of the process, right? If you, if you set up the foundation correctly, you can build rapidly on top of that. And I wasn't even the fastest growing company. Like, I think on the profit uh, 50, I was somewhere in the middle. On the 150, I was like two thirds of the way up. So there was a lot of other companies that were growing way faster than I was in the same time frame because it's all based on time frame, right? Then they and they validate it with um, your audited uh, books, um, your reconciled books, you know, from the year before. So it's accurate. Um, they're all private companies, so they don't publish uh, profits, but what they were publishing was the uh, sales receipts. So, yeah, is it a rapid path? It is, absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you guys aren't on the email list, make sure you take note of the ticker below. Because um, that's where you get notified of all the stuff that's going on, should anything ever happen to me on the YouTubes. But... Um, there's going to be some, some emails that go out on November 1st onwards uh, talking about the course, uh, some of the testimonials, what's in it, um, all of that stuff. So if you're on the email list, you'll probably start seeing those in a couple of days. But uh, again, if you've already seen this from the last uh, quarterly launch and you just want in, the link is in the description. You can just go ahead and grab it. Um, let me grab the link actually over here. If you guys have questions, you can drop them in the, um, the chat. And I'll, uh, I'll certainly get to them. Um, let me open this up over here. And boom. So what I'll do is I'll just put it in the live chat and pin it there. Grab the course. Does that work? Anyway, there you go. It's in the live chat. Um, so... Let's talk about entrepreneurship and setting the groundwork for this because it's it's not a easy thing. I think it's a simple thing once you get it right and you understand what's involved and how to engineer it because you can engineer a good business. Like most people by default do it wrong. Just like by default, happy wife, happy life. You know, you hear the vows. Uh, riches and, and sickness, uh, health and poor, and it doesn't matter. She's always going to stick around. Don't don't even sweat it. She's not going anywhere. Just say I do and sign over here and walk around the table and do your reception and it's good, boys, right? And, you know, just like with relationships and the red pilling that we get there with whatever it happens to be, she steps out, you know, she like the whole love into perpetuity doesn't exist and then you have this awakening I think a lot of people, when it comes to starting up a business for themselves, at some point have this grand awakening because the illusion of I'm going to be a big boss and be an entrepreneur and run this corporation. And here's my business cards with my name on it. And it says president and CEO just underneath there. And you feel grand and special. 
the vast majority of businesses out there that start will never break more than a million dollars a year in annual sales. The number is something like 97%. So the vast majority of people out there that are holding out to the public that they're an entrepreneur, I'm not saying they're not, but the vast majority of them are not cracking more than a million dollars in annual sales. Um, they're mom and pop shops. They're, you know, your dry cleaners, you know, at the corner, you're the, you know, the corner store that's doing a uh, nail salon stuff, you know, like the standard simplistic conventional cookie cutter thing that we've always been told to do. Like when my granddad in England retired from the Royal Air Force, you know, he, the first thing he did was he, he was like, right, I want to go and become an entrepreneur. You, you know what he did? He did what everybody else did. He went and opened up a pub, right? Cause that's, because that's the path to riches. And he found out it was long hours for not a lot of money and a whole lot of headache, right? So this is the path that most people choose is something that seems common. Oh, I can set up an e-commerce store and I can move shit, right? Like all I got to do is find it for cheap in China, go to Alibaba, buy a, a crate, a shipping container or whatever of the, of the niche, the product that I want to sell. I'll do Amazon FBA, which is fulfilled by Amazon. I put my shit in their warehouse. I do my ads. I do my paid advertising. Uh, people click, they buy, and then the profit rolls in. And that sounds simple and easy. Oh, you just have to do the research on the right, the right topic. You know, you have to do the research on the right product and make sure you angle it right and you twist it sort of this way. And it's like, it can work for a few months sometimes. The problem when you build your business on somebody else's platform like Amazon is you very quickly learn that it's not stable. You rely on the algorithms when people search for things showing your product. And if your product's a hot seller, anybody can come in and undercut, including Amazon, white label some shit and compete against it and suppress you in the algorithms. And you go looking for other solutions. Oh, let's go to Shopify. We'll build a Shopify store and then we'll market it on Facebook and uh, Instagram and YouTube pre-roll ads and all that sort of stuff. And it's like, okay, that's another way to do it, right? But then that starts eating into the profit margins. Oh, and by the way, you're moving a physical product. And what happens when you move a physical product? Shit gets lost in the mail. It gets broken. People receive it and they lie and they say they never got it. And you have to reship another one. There's returns. So eliminating the potential and the possibility for chaos and headache in your business can be engineered from the get-go, you know, is the point that I'm making. So I'm just using Amazon FBA just as one example, right? There's lots of other things out there that you hear all the time that, you know, they're on social media. Oh, if you sign up for my program or my university or some shit like this uh, and go and do copywriting or video editing or any version of any of those things, you'll become vastly wealthy and influential and, you know, women will be throwing themselves at you, right? It doesn't work that way. My, my emails are filled till this day. And I keep mentioning this year over year. It's been happening for the last few years because it's been normalized. It's been pumped out in the public so much now. Everybody's a fucking video editor. Everybody. You know what I pay for edited reels? Like 20 bucks. That's it. That's with captions, with music, upload, everything, right? Because there's somebody in Indonesia that's willing to do that for next to nothing. It's not a path to riches or wealth, right? It's... It's a path out of poverty, maybe in that country where you can make a pretty decent living, but you're not going to be rolling around in a Lambo, right? Like you're going to pay some bills, right? Like it'll be fine. Copywriting is another one too. Emails blowing up all the time. Let me do my copywriting. They DM me. It's like they all have these creative like ways to sort of try to get your attention, but you're one of a couple of dozen every single day, seven days a week, 30 days a month, you know, 12 months of the year. Like, you know, it, it adds up and you're competing for the attention of entrepreneurs, which for the most part, like guys like me, I write my own copy, right? Like I'll do my own emails. So if you get on my email list and you get an email, it's from me. I was actually thinking about something the other day. I think I'm going to have Steve from accounting and you guys tell me if you think this is a good idea. We're going to have Steve from accounting potentially write a field report on ladies night. What do you think? Yeah, we can give it a go. <laughs> to sort of summarize it from the perspective of Steve. Anyway, a little bit, you know, distracted because he's sitting there watching me as I'm doing the show. So 
back to the uh, you know paths to to wealth when it comes to becoming an entrepreneur. Um, what other example? Like you guys, tell me what you can think of in the chat that is a potential path to wealth, right? You know, you get guys that say that they're in the weed business, like I do 420. Okay, so let's say that you're in the cannabis business or the CBD business, or you're a grower, or you're, you're or you're a distributor, right? Uh, here, anyway, in Canada, if you get the license to open up a dispensary, then you've got to have a physical storefront with signage, with rent, you know, license agreements. And I know guys that are in this space; they got in the space early, before the licenses were handed out like candy. Uh, and you had to jump through legislative hoops to get them. And there were so few that were available. They actually made money, but now again, the markets become saturated. So I don't know where James is that, that does, you know, like 420 or whatever that is. But, um, for the most part, again, moving a physical product, you have to have storefront, you have to have regulators up your ass about everything. These are things that you can engineer into a business that you can avoid, right? Um, what do we got here in the chat? Does the access to tu tutorials lessons expire after? No, the access is lifetime. As I mean, as long as Teachable exists, you will have access to all of the lessons. They're always there. And if I add any extra lessons or webinars, it's included. There's no extra price to pay. You always have access to them. So check it out. Um, let me just pin that at the top there. So it's at the top. It's in the right place. Um, Jake here says, uh, started my own business is the best thing I've ever done. I make my own schedule and I didn't force myself to get the job. See, buttes. Chris says, I told certain institution, institutional clients to kick rocks when they said they needed our jobs. We, when they said we needed our jobs to do their work, I think that's jabs. I still won't touch the work regardless of value. See, that's when you're in a position to say no, right? Like that's ideally what, entrepreneurship should get you to is a position of F you, not just F you to, you know, point at people and say F you, but F you as an F you money. So you don't need to take jobs. You don't need to do or perform tasks because of that. Um, what else we got in here? Considering opening own practice as CPA, your thoughts. So anything to do with accounting is a service. One of the downsides to working as an accountant one it's 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 not the most unless you really love numbers and reconciling columns and stuff like that it's not the most interesting <coughs> line of work or business excuse me i mean i've been fortunate enough to have some cool accountants and i select accountants to work with that i want to sit down and have lunch with if I don't jive, we're not doing business. So again, you know, things with professional designation, like, you know, we're talking earlier about you can make a good amount of money if you're a licensed accountant. He's saying, should I open up my own practice? So versus being a accountant that's licensed to work in an office as an employee versus being the employer and employing other people to work for you, you have to take on the task of marketing, acquiring clients, customer service. You got to procure uh, space, uh, licensing, dues. Um, you need E and O insurance, errors and omission, um, in case you ever get sued. Um, you're probably going to have a lawyer on retainer running your own business, and it's location dependent to a certain region, which I'm not a big fan of, right? Because again, if something happens and you want to pick up your business and just go somewhere else you can go to another country you can get a starlink and drive an rv around north and south america if you want and do your business that way you can be on a sailboat in the middle of the ocean with a, a starlink and do your business that way i'm not a big fan of location dependent businesses which keep you anchored to a certain locale right because then you're stuck there right like you've set down roots you want to get up and go somewhere else it's not always plausible right legislation and rules can change in the jurisdiction that you're licensed to work in that aren't favorable, which I saw happen here in my debt business between 2010 and 2013, right? I've talked about that before. So is it a easy, lucrative, and fun business opening up a practice as a CPA? No, I would say no, it's not. 
Let me scroll through a few more of these, see what you guys are on about here. Again, if you have any questions or examples that you want me to touch on, what do you think about a bookkeeping business? Another good question. That's another business that's location dependent, requires you to market to people to get their business. It's a low billable rate. Um, bookkeepers here, 90 to 110 bucks an hour, you know, maybe 80 on the lower end if they're junior, if they work from their own home. Um, it's a time for money job, right? So if you can only bill $80 an hour, for example, and um, you've only got three or four hours of work one day, then what are you doing the rest of the time? You're going to schmooze. You're going to have to try to find some business. You're going to have to try to find some clients. And even if you're maxed out fully, you know, throughout the day, right? Like, let's say that you're fully maxed out. You're doing 80 hours, right? That's $6,400 per pay period, right? Sorry, let's go 6,400 times uh, 26 weeks because that's usually standard. So that's $166,000 a year. So if you're a bookkeeper, fully booked, okay, 80 hour work weeks bi-weekly for an entire year, the maximum you're ever gonna earn is $166,000, that's it. Now you're gonna have to take away your expenses to run that business. You might be left with $100,000. You might actually arguably be better off working for somebody getting paid $100,000 so you don't have to deal with the headache of all the other bullshit because like the max cap you're going to make is 166 dollars right? $166,400. So I'm not a big fan of trading time for money at a low rate. Look, if you're a very successful lawyer and you're billing yourself out at $1,000 an hour, um, cool. That's way better than 80 or, or 110, right? Uh, it's still going to cap you, right? Like, Let's take a lawyer that bills himself out at $1,000 an hour. That's $80,000 times 26. That's 2.08 million. You're doing real well. You're doing real, real well. But you're working all the fucking time doing law, which honestly, I would rather gouge my eyeballs out than read all that shit. Let's see what else we got here. Human beings are the worst part of a business. So that's the other thing too, right? You can engineer a business that doesn't require employees. I've employed a lot of people, okay? In this business and in the, in the corporations that I worked for prior to that, I've employed or terminated hundreds and hundreds of people, right? There's flaws with human beings. There's a reason why McDonald's is now opening up fully automated McDonald's outlets now that are open 24 seven, the robots cook everything perfectly every single time delivered faster than any human being can flip a burger or, or drop fries into a tray. It's, it's, it's a process and a system that is far more profitable for them because they don't have to deal with an employee that calls in sick, doesn't show up, has to take mat leave. They're banging other employees in the back room and HR has to get involved. And all of a sudden Karen's yelling at somebody. There's none of these problems that that exist in an environment where you don't have a human being working as an employee and that takes the humans out of the equation i think you're going to see a, um you know things like universal basic income kick off and you know become a lot more popular and you're going to be seeing people getting like a a base stable like living i'm not going to call it a wage but a living donation monthly from the government because let's be honest i mean they just print money so who fucking cares right like it's just the way the government operates now so you're going to see a lot of these low level things automate or outsource or made obsolete, you know, if anything, and having employees is something that you can engineer into a business or you can engineer out of the business. Um, the kinds of businesses that I talk about in my course in the school of entrepreneurship are what are defined as easy, lucrative, and fun. And they're usually either service or information based. So there's no products to move or sell or stock in a warehouse or return or get broken or get lost or any of that bullshit. So it's either a service type of business or it's an information type of business. It's location independent, meaning you don't have to have a storefront with a neon sign and a door that's locked and unlocked with store hours in the front or any of that shit. It's not, it's never going to have to comply with stand on this dot, wear a face diaper or take this experimental jab because it's location independent and it sells a service or information. And you also generally don't need employees. You might need some contractors to do some work. I've, I've got some contractors that do work for me, but I don't have any salaried employees that are ever going to, you know, 
Well, let me talk to HR because, you know, Becky was mean to me today. Fuck that shit. I don't have time for that stuff anymore. So you can actually create a really, really profitable, lucrative, free business that lets you maneuver wherever you want if you engineer it correctly from the get-go. Um, yeah, Rob here says the weed industry is saturated and going downhill. All right. And that's also one of the things that I talk about in the course material in the School of Entrepreneurship is pivoting. Pivoting is something that you have to get good at, right? Um, like Netflix back in the day, most people don't know this, they were competing with Blockbuster. So this is dating me. Blockbuster was a video store. You would go there, you would rent your DVDs, your VHS or whatever it happened to be. You would watch the movie, you would return it the next day. If you dropped it off late, they charge you late fleas, blah, blah, blah. Netflix's model was, we're not gonna have storefront. We're just going to mail you, you know, your rentals, right? And they figured out very quickly that data can be transferred over the internet. So rather than having people wait for their movie rental to show up in their mailbox, and then, you know, they have to take it out, watch it, put it back in and then ship it back sort of thing. They could just scroll on a console or on a smart TV or something, go to what they want to watch, hit play and boom. Oh, wow. It's right there. I don't have to leave my house. I don't even have to go to my mailbox anymore. They completely pivoted the business model from moving videos in hardware format to a streaming format, right? And there's lots of stories like this out there, like uh, Instagram, um, if I'm not mistaken, competed with uh, Kodak, uh, put Kodak out of business. And Instagram, before it started, was more of a location type of um, business. So it was like uh, Foursquare, for those of you guys that remember what that is. I'll explain it for those that don't. But Foursquare was like, you would go somewhere, you would sort of check in and be like, oh, I'm here at this location. And it was kind of like a location announcement app. And you could take a picture. Only they realized that that wasn't something they could really monetize and scale up on. And people weren't that interested in it because people like pictures. So they started creating filters and they just pivoted the business completely into what it is today. And they sold it to Facebook for a billion dollars, like only a few years after that pivot, right? Go do your homework and research on that. Uh, Brian says, Rich, what do you think about the market for many more red pill aware teachers, speakers, writers? It seems to be a new frontier with unlimited potential reaching far beyond just money. I mean, you're talking about the Mano Swamp now and most of them are dorks and they're useless. Uh, if you got to know them personally, you wouldn't want anything to do with them. So uh, like, d look, if you want to have these conversations, do it if you want. I'm going to say this though, right? Like people will figure out what you're made of over time eventually based on your behavior, based on how you hold yourself out, based on your track record of proven success or failures, if it exists, they're going to know about it. But there's a lot of this stuff out there right now where it's like, uh, what do they call it? Grifting, right? Um, having something people need, absolutely. Have something people need, man. <laughs> you know, I was talking to... Uh, Steve from accounting during the drive from the airport about um, Michael Franchese, what's his name? The mobster guy? Yeah. He's, um, you know, he said in his book that um, you don't actually make money unless you're a counterfeiter or the government, because a counterfeiter prints it and the government prints it as well. So unless you're the government or a counterfeiter, you don't, you never make money, you take it, he said. And it makes a lot of sense, right? Because there's all this stuff out there. Money's just flowing throughout the internet right now. And all you have to do is just stand in front of it and get in the way of it. Just reach out there and grab some, right? And it's not like you just reach out and take it, but you create something of value that compels people to take their wallet, open it up, put the money down, whip out a credit card and charge it because it's a compelling enough offer. Like the people that sign up for the School of Entrepreneurship find it a compelling enough offer that they're like, yes, I want your 10 hours worth of uh, video lectures and knowledge distilled down here so I can learn what the mindset is of successful entrepreneurs. That's what the course is, right? Uh, Chad says, Rich, I made 270,000 last year selling showers at age 25. Let's get a round of applause for Chad Wilson. $270,000, nothing to sneeze at at the age of 25. Biggest bottleneck was getting leads. Any advice on getting more leads? Depends on the kind of showers that you're selling, Chad. If you're selling showers to seniors, you would definitely want to place your ads into retrofitting your 
like empty nesters, you know, for example, like empty nesters, the kids have all left. The parents are all older. Usually everything in the house is original. The, the kitchen cabinetry, the bathroom, the powder, it's all fucking original. They never change anything. If you can advertise to that demographic of the empty nesters that have the residential home, you can tie it into a reverse mortgage. That's one way that you can do it, which would finance the cost of the um, re-engineered bathroom sort of thing. Um, but if that's what it is, like that's one angle that would work, you know, there's a whole bunch of different angles that you can use for something like that. But again, that, that $270,000 that you've made at the age of 25 selling showers, working your ass off last year, saying that the middle, biggest bottleneck was getting leads. Well, I'm assuming somebody already has a shower and you're retrofitting a better version of the shower, right? So it's not like they don't have a shower. They already have something. So they have to make the decision to improve something that already exists in their house. So that's, that's a bit of a marketing fuck up because it's, it's work convincing somebody. It's like saying, Hey, look, man, like you got a car that works perfectly fine, but trade it in and get this new car. Showers aren't really like cars. So it's not, not the best example, but you get the idea, right? Um, but again, you know, you're always limited to how many showers can you sell? Do you install them? Do you have installers doing them? If you have installers and you got to hire them, they take a cut in the profit. Um, then you've got to book the day or, or two days off to do the install, whatever it happens to be, ship it back and forth. You can't do it in the trunk of a sedan. You're going to need a fucking truck and a trailer to move that around. Um, there's a lot of things to contemplate, which add layers of complexity to a business that can make some money, but in my opinion, isn't something that is scalable or even sellable right? Because people don't rebuy sh it showers, right? It's not like you have a book of business and you've got, oh, I've got 127 customers that buy showers. Well, they bought their shower. That's it. It's done, right? You don't have recurring revenue. You don't have a book of business. You don't have something that's sellable to a, a venture company, an angel investor. You don't have anything that's sellable to anybody that wants to buy a, a type of business like that. You have equipment, you know, you got your trucks, you got your install gear, you know, whatever it happens to be. So that's one of the flaws that I'm, you know, talking about is, yeah, you know, you'll probably make a few hundred thousand dollars up to a million bucks, maybe a little bit more depending on how you structure the business, but margins will get thin. You'll have regulations, you'll have legal issues. You're going to have people that don't pay. You don't understand how many contractors that I talk to right now, whether it's masonry work or it's pools or anything like this that do trade type of work where they're out because they've done a job and they never got fucking paid, right? And they put their time, their labor and paid their staff to do things that the customer never actually paid for, for whatever reason, it could be any number of reasons, but it happens, right? So again, this is something that you can engineer into a business that's a great business. The whole point of the school of entrepreneurship is to get your mindset, get your mindset squared away in such a way that you can create a business that minimizes headaches, risk exposure, unnecessary things like moving a physical product or dealing with employees. You ideally want it set up to create recurring revenue. So monthly subscribers that pay you something monthly, you know, like along the way. There's a lot of things that are engineered into it. And again, like I've got 10 hours of material in the school of entrepreneurship in the video lectures. I can't possibly get into that in like an hour show. I'm going to do my best to answer as many questions as I can and enlighten, but that's really the point. Uh, good luck in hiring all-star employees that want to work in a weed store. Yeah. I mean, all-star employees, you're going to get some A players from time to time, but you get a lot of B and C players. And I think one of the big mistakes that employers make with B and C players is they try to make their B and C player players better. And all you end up really with is a weak player with really strong, weak skills. <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, as an employer, you want to invest in your A players. That's where you want to put your time and money and ideally get rid of your C players and give your B players notice. It's either this is the expectation or you're out. <clears throat> uh, yeah, here we go. Ariel says, dude, I emailed you about writing your email sequence. LOL, never mind. See, like, dude, Ariel, like, I get people that, I get these, like, multiple times a day. It's not special. It's not unique. And I could hire Ariel or the next guy that shows up, 
but I, I'm not going to go through the time to tell them what it is that I'm about, what my products and services are. I don't want their cookie cutter bullshit on my email list. I write my own emails. I'm okay with writing my own emails, right? I would even argue that I even kind of enjoy it, you know. <clears throat> uh, Lee Michael says, anyone reading this that's considering signing up for the School of Entrepreneurship, I highly recommend it. It's a mindset course, not a plug and play how to. The mindset material is well worth it. That's what it is. Bottom line, it's, you know, it's a mindset course that teaches you to adopt the mindsets of the most successful entrepreneurs out there. You're probably going to get the course material and go through it and never start up a business. I'll be honest with you, but you will be enlightened after that time that you spend consuming the material and attending the Zoom calls. And at some point, five months down the road, 10 months down the road, you might come across a business idea that's like, oh shit, that ticks off all the boxes Rich talked about. This is going to be an easy, lucrative, and fun business. And then you start looking at the market. Then you look at the competitors. Then you look at the margins. Then you look at, hey, I don't even need employees to run this. Or I can automate systems and processes. It's a mindset course, guys. It's not a do A, B, and C, and you will spit out a you know, EFG type of business. It's understand the mindset that the most successful entrepreneurs use to create and run businesses and then adopt and use that in your own business yourself. And it's suitable for anybody that's contemplating starting up a business. It's suitable for anybody that's already running a business that might want to pivot it into a different direction. It's suitable in both those uh, cases. So thank you for that, uh, Lee, appreciate it. <clears throat> Learning wholesale real estate, so far I've done nothing. How's that working out? Thanks for the super chat, 5RC. Uh, accountants need to play in the gray areas, but never land you in shit. Yeah. Accountants are, accountants are a special breed, man. Cross T's dot I's. They'll, you know, they'll tell you where a good account will tell you where you can lean into without causing problems. If that makes sense. Um, recovering know it all says rich. What if I have no marketable skill or product? Then find one. Like I said earlier, product generally isn't the way to go. Moving a physical product, a calculator, it doesn't matter what it is. Moving, like, this is a shit business. It doesn't matter if it's if it's this, if it's men's jewelry, if it's rings, whatever it happens to be. If you're moving some kind of physical product, you have to procure it at a low cost. You have to stock it. You have to ship it. People are going to say it got lost, it got destroyed in the uh, you, you know the shipping process. It wasn't on the front porch when they came home when it was, said it was delivered. Somebody stole it. Blah blah blah. You're going to deal with all of that. So the first mistake you're making, recover, recovering know it all, is you're talking about a product, marketable skill. I guarantee you have some skill in something. You must. You ex I mean, your your avatar says recovering know it all. You must know something. Subscriptions to something that you worked on once, something like a fitness program. There's lots of things that you can subscribe to. Um, I mean, Netflix made a massive business on $9.99 a month. I mean, that's what they kicked off at. And then they slowly increased the rates and higher streaming and 4K and multiple account users. And it's probably upwards of like $19 to $24 a month now. But they made their, their, their vast fortune Okay. Fang companies, you know, we talked about this earlier, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix is in Fang, right? It's one of the big tech co companies in Silicon Valley and they got it off recurring revenue subscriptions, right? And it doesn't have to be large. I mean, Peter, Peter Diamandis said, if you want to become a billionaire, solve a problem for a billion people and charge them a dollar each, right? Subscription revenue type thing. Does that make sense? Uh, Jordan says, what state location from your knowledge would be the most optimal for starting a career in fitness STEM? Well, fitness and STEM is two different things. 20 years old, associates, computer science degree, CPT cert and strength and conditioning cert. Um, pick a path, man. You know, do you want to go down the road of STEM 
you're basically going to become an employee. The chances of you leaving your job as an employee, become an entrepreneur exist, of course, but chances are you're going to become an employee making good money. But again, you know, five, six years during the next scandemic, stand on this dot, wear this face diaper. Oh, it's time for your Jabba juice, right? Um, and then you're also talking about fitness as well as a potential career path. Um, John Goodman, friend of mine from Toronto, started up the Personal Trainers Development Center. So I think it's the ptdc.com is a website. Um, he started out as a personal trainer. So one of the one of the ideas that I'll share with you that, that come out of the course, I mean, I get into it in more detail, obviously, but um, R&D, which stands for not research and development, but for rip off and duplicate. You can go and find uh, systems and processes and procedures that exist elsewhere and then take those and apply it to yourself or your business. Um, all that John did was he was a personal trainer. He's like, I can't scale this. I'm only going to book so many customers at 40, 50, $60 an hour per training session. And then he pivoted to training the trainers. Um, a lot of people do this, you know, they'll like, they'll be an expert in a certain space. You know, when somebody says I have no marketable skills, bullshit, you know, something about something. If you're in a space and you know, personal training, you've done personal training, you know how to personal train, you look good, you know how to, you know, teach people how to look good and, and eat right and train properly. Then there's a lot of people out there that want to be personal trainers that don't know how to become personal trainers that don't know how to get customers that don't know how to market. So he hits it from that angle. You can go take a look at his website. It's the Personal Trainers Development Center. So ptdc.com. You can check it out, you know, for an idea from that angle. Uh, Jake, being an employer is better than being an employee, but it's basically creating your own golden handcuffs, which of course helps you find better alternatives to an elf business. Yeah, Jake's been in the course. He's seen it all. It's right there. Um, what about phone and electronic flipping? Yeah. Okay. So this is like one of these side hustles that Jason's talking about. You're never going to make a million dollars. This is not a business that you can sell. It is not location independent because you're always going to have to be on Facebook marketplace or Kijiji or Craigslist or some version of whatever has to exist for you to find old phones to buy low and sell high. You're moving a physical product. You have to meet people. To me, that doesn't sound like a good business. There's there's lots of people that do it. Like I know a guy right now that makes an entire living and feeds his family, staying completely off the grid, doesn't pay taxes, works in cash only, doing flipping of phones and electronic devices. Okay, you can do that. You're never going to make more than $150,000, $200,000 a year max. And some people might be happy with that. And that's totally fine, right? I mean, if that's what your goal is, not that's your goal. But when I talk about the stuff and the content that's in the school of entrepreneurship. I'm talking about building something that's sellable, that's scalable, that's easy, lucrative, and fun that can grow to a million dollars a year in annual sales. Cause dude, what you're doing to flip phones and electronic bullshit, physical movement of these used items for some cash with a couple of bucks margin here and there. I mean, I don't know, you buy a phone for 200, you sell it for 350. I don't know what it is, but it's small amounts of money. How much time do you spend looking, messaging back and forth, dealing with some fucking retard? It's like, what's your best price? I can't meet it this time. Oh, what's the condition of it? Can you send me three more pictures of the side of it? I don't have time for that. I don't. I'd rather smash the phone with a sledgehammer and laugh just for shits and giggles, right? This is a way to make some money. I'm not going to lie. It's a way to make some money. Is it a way to build a scalable business that's sellable? Nobody's ever going to come knocking on your door going, hey, you seem to have figured out a way to flip, you know, like phones and electronics. Can I buy that business? I'd like to offer you $10 million for that right now. Never going to happen. You don't have any subscription revenue. You don't have a customer base. It's just flipping electronic devices. Like, guys, you're thinking too small. You have to think anyway. Why not think fucking bigger? Think about it. Think bigger. Software development company? Sure. Do you know how to write code? Absolutely. You don't even need to know how to write code. You just have to have an idea and hire somebody that knows how to write code. Uh, 5RC. I had a question to go with the $10. Okay, well, I'll look for your 5RC next one here. Uh, if you're not making money while you sleep, you will die working. Warren Buffett. Uh, what about a mortgage 
banker broker. It's a job, just over broke. I know lots of people that work for financial institutions and uh, banks that uh, work as a mortgage agent. Now, there's a difference between a mortgage broker and a mortgage agent. 95% of people that say that they're mortgage brokers are mortgage agents and they're working under the broker's license. And then they, you know, they get the large chunk of commission off the broker's license, but they can't work without working under the broker. So the broker has to look over everything. And again, this is a, this is very similar to being like a real estate agent. Okay. There's way more people that have a real estate license than there is homes that are available to be sold on the marketplace just like mortgages. There's way more people that have a real estate license, have a mortgage license, have an insurance uh, license, any of these like licenses to broker whatever it happens to be, then there are customers available for that service. So it's a saturated market. You're going to be working a lot on evenings and weekends. It's not location independent. You sure as fuck can't run this from Fiji on a sailboat. Um, if they want to lock you down and make you stand on dots, you're, you got to comply. You know, you work for a financial institution. Uh, it's going to happen again. Mark my words. It could be a, a few years. It could be 10, 15 years down the road. It's going to happen again. They're going to pull the same bullshit routine on us again. I guarantee it. So do I think that that adheres to the notion of entrepreneurship? Absolutely not. It, like franchises don't again, franchises. Okay, you want to open up a uh, Tim Hortons coffee shop, you know, here in Canada, Tim Hortons is very popular coffee. You have to work at the location a certain amount of time. I looked into it a few years ago because people line up down a fucking street for their Tim Hortons coffee, right? You have to work there for a certain amount of time. You're buying everything from them, the signage, the label, like it's, it's plug and play. You know, you pull out a few hundred thousand dollars to buy the franchise uh, license you run it, you're there up, you know, most of the time, if not a good chunk of the time, you're dealing with employees, you're dealing with physical product, you're anchored there. They say, oh, by the way, put these dots on the ground now because it's dot time. Make sure everybody's wearing a face diaper. Oh, you got to get all your staff jabbed, including you too, right? Digital Escape says anything you create should always optimize for time freedom. Think about it. You can engineer it into your business. Um, you don't have to worry about being a victim of workplace mobbing. As an entrepreneur, you don't have to worry about being a victim of work. I don't know what workplace mobbing is. Is that is that uh, employee theft? I mean, that's another problem for stores right now in the States. You see these fucking mobs running into them and just stealing shit. I mean, that's another problem, right? You could have that. You could have employee theft. There's all kinds of problems that, you know, exist as you create a business that's cookie cutter. That is hard, annoying, lame, and frustrating. Any lucrative business that precludes having employees sounds wonderful, a dream. There's lots of them out there. There's loads and loads of them out there. Uh, I mean, I'm running one with everything that I do, right? Getting less than half. Yes, I have to pivot. Got a lot of things going on in the chat here. I didn't uh, restrict this today, so bear with me as I kind of go through this. Uh, that's what Andrew Tate says. Good job. Awesome. Okay, so I think I'm caught up on everything here. Oh, hang on. Aaron says, hey, Rich, you ever think learning a language is an effective skill to invest time into improving a career? See, Aaron, you're thinking too small, dude. I mean, look, you speak English, you want to improve your career prospect, you want to learn Spanish, you want to use learn Chinese or something like that. Do it when you create a location independent business because you're going to be spending time in Asia or you're going to be spending time in El Salvador or something like that. But honing skills for career prospects, have you not been listening to the theme of the show? Did you not watch last week's show when I was talking about careers and jobs? J-O-B, just over broke. Pay attention, please. Uh, I'm in Washington State. Weed shops get robbed and smashed through all the time. Recently, an employee was killed. Some old crap with the old illegal methods. The only difference now is they're taxed. Yeah, it's like, 
again, this is what most people set up, right? Thoughts on a marketing agency, getting clinics more appointments. Yeah, dime a dozen. I get I get hit on all the time by these marketing agencies, right? Oh, you know, we can get you listed at number one in Google local search or some shit like that. Oh, I can't do that myself. I already know how to do that myself if I want to get a local top rate. It's it's not difficult, right? And to be honest with you, marketing agencies, like unless you're unless you're dealing with something very, very high level, you know, like you're a big corporation, multinational making hundreds of millions of dollars, it doesn't make any sense to hire any of these professionals because genuinely speaking, you're going to do it better as the proprietor. Um, been doing this for five years, still squeaking by. See, guys, this is why I usually restrict the chat is it's hard for me to kind of go through it whenever there's something that pops up. I'm just going to deal with the super chats now to keep it simple. Book suggestions. I read Felix Dennis, How to Get Rich. It says, if it floats... F's or flies, rent it. He said he got lucky the harder he worked. Rip FD. Um, I've not read his his book, but the notion of, yeah, if it, if it floats, flies, or F's, rent it, it's not new. What if I chose the wrong career? Medicine is definitely not going to make me a millionaire. Then recognize that you've entered into the wrong sphere. I think there was a guy that called in last week that was from South America, and he was a doctor. He wasn't making a lot of money and we were talking about moving to the United States because you get paid a hell of a lot more over there in the medical field. Um, that's one option. Or one of my best friends is a, a doctor, right? He's a licensed physician, but he's also an entrepreneur and he runs a whole series of urgent care clinics. And I asked him one time, I said, do you consider yourself a doctor or an entrepreneur first? And he said, entrepreneur, 100%. And it's the same thing with, like I have another business partner um, that is a lawyer and an entrepreneur because he's involved in a bunch of different startups and as an investor, he's had some good exits. And he went to law school, got his law degree and realized, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing billable hours and like a lot of the shit that goes on behind it. He was telling us all these stories. There's a lot of fuckery that goes on in law. And, you know, same question. I'm like, do you see yourself as a lawyer first or as an entrepreneur first? Answer again is entrepreneur. Right. So even guys that are going to get licensed designations, professional designations to work as a lawyer or to work as an accountant or to work as whatever it happens to be a doctor, when they lean into entrepreneurship and they see the value there and the scalability of it, that's where that's where you create the wealth. That's where you cr create the freedom. Right. How about selling farm equipment? It's a physical product. Now, if you're selling expensive farm equipment and you get paid a commission as a high ticket item, I don't know what these John Deere tractors cost that, you know, they're just massive. You know, like, you, know you always see them on the road at the harvest time, sort of clogging up traffic before they go off, you know, to the next field sort of thing. I would imagine there's several hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars in some of that equipment. So sell it, get paid a percentage of that as a commission. But again, you're still working in a job. You're still working as an employee. You're not an entrepreneur. But yes, you can make some good money at it. A lot of what about this? What about that? That's fine. You know, I'll try to get through as many as I can. What about a custom meditation app bespoke to community leaders? Example, meditation app uh, that used your voice for red pill entrepreneurs that you could use in your community. Um most people that consume red pill content, I'll be honest with you, they mostly masturbate to it. They don't do anything with it. It's it's a, a small percentage of people that actually apply it to their lives. And once they apply it and they level up, they don't need it again, right? It's like, you know, like how do you game? It's like you don't memorize lines and read pickup artistry books and make cold approaches. You become the game. Like you, you understand the notion is used everywhere that you go from the girl that works behind the bank counter uh, you know, to whatever, right? Like you use game, you know, throughout your life and it's not always just, you know, for intimate reasons, it can be to, you know, for persuasion or, you know, to get somebody to see certain ideas differently. Right. Um, but there's lots of meditation apps out there, man. There's loads and loads of meditation apps right now. And the vast majority of them are a freemium model, meaning you use it for free and they have upsells within the app that they hope people will buy eventually. Um, I don't know what the subscription rate is, how long they have their average customer for, what kind of margins they make. But 
if they're good, you know, they could be good. Look up um, Headspace. You know, they're one of the leaders in that in that area. And if you can get some data on what Headspace is doing and how they do it, do some R and D, rip off and duplicate, and create a better version that maybe caters to the red pill, right? Like there's, you know, there might be something there. Life insurance agents, your sales rep, you know, your sales, it's a licensed professional, you know. Buddy of mine owns a life insurance uh, company. You know, he sells all kinds of insurance, automotive, life, all that kind of stuff. He does well. You've got a couple of nice Porsches, right? But he owns the business, right? Like he's not a life insurance agent. Um, Iranolola, Iranolola, if you have $5,000 IT course, would you spend time building a YouTube channel to advertise or would you pay for marketing? What's the most cost effective? The building a YouTube channel is going to take a while. If you're lucky, if you have a horse, if you have an entire stack of horseshoes up your ass, six months minimum. Average for most people is going to be a few years. I had... Uh, Dr. Orion Taraban on for a podcast once uh, in the last couple of months. And I was talking about the early stages of his, of his uh, channel. Cause now it's start, starting to blow up. And he's like, yeah, for the first two years I was uploading, it was crickets. Nothing happened. Nobody watched. Nothing really happened. And then all of a sudden one of the videos got picked up in the algorithm and boom, now I'm famous sort of thing. Um, so you have to be prepared if you're going to do something like build an audience to commit to it over a long period of time. And, that's what I tell people, right? It's like, you know, look, if you're going to do YouTube, set a schedule, produce on that schedule. I mean, it's the reason why the Unplugged Alpha podcast is every Monday night. It's always Monday night, right? It's like I've got 111 episodes of this, right? And then I've got Before the Train Wreck, which is another podcast that I retired that turned into the Unplugged Alpha, which went for about 105 episodes. So I've done over 200 episodes now of podcasting on pretty much the same sort of topic, right? I mean, I talk about different things from time to time, but you get the idea, right? So it's a commitment. And then paying for adver paying for uh, leads isn't the smartest way to go. I'll tell you right now, I don't spend a dime on advertising. I spend zero, a big fat donut on advertising. Some people see um, Grondike soap ads on my feed. I don't I don't pay for those. That's, that's them running their stuff on my accounts, right? Uh, I don't pay for any advertising for anything, nothing, anything like my books. Like I don't pay Amazon to promote or sponsor um, book sales or anything like that. People just buy them because they know, like, and trust me. And they want to, you know, give me their money in exchange for uh, like a summarized book. What happened to the Spanish version? You gave it to me over here. There's also the Spanish version now too. I got a couple extra copies here and, you know, you know, the hardback. So, if it's something that interests you, you know, grab the copies. It's, it, you know, it, it's a, it's a nice gesture from your perspective and from mine. It just makes me feel good to know that people are reading the books and getting value out of them. Like I read the um, reviews and the testimonials. I get it. Like, you know, but you have to have an audience to sell things like that, right? Like, you, like commanding an audience was, uh, you know, the third one that I mentioned with dealing with actors, influencers, uh, athletes, and stuff like that. And, you know, when you, you know, have an audience that follows your stuff, like there's, you know, a bunch of people watching right now, I can say, hey guys, you know, I've got this course on entrepreneurship. It's pinned at the top where it says grab the course and in the description below. If you want to learn what all the best entrepreneurs use to build the best businesses, get it. Um, you can spend tens of thousands of dollars every year in some bullshit college or university where they're going to infuse some wokeness and rainbows and pronouns down your throat as you're trying to learn something generally from people that have never run multiple su successful businesses, let alone one distilled down in some course, right? For a lot of money. I've priced it at under $2,000 and it's all you need. It's everything you need. So and you also get monthly Zoom calls with me too, right? Uh, Rob, uh, thank you, Rob. Appreciate it. Um, the house usually wins. Get out of the system. That's correct. Caterpillar. Sorry, I'm trying to run through all of these motivational. 
um rr i used to live gang life in toronto been shot and stabbed and changed my life now jim embracing masculinity i want to influence kids who are lost to change their life how should i pursue that um youtube straight up um there's a lot of people that do what you're talking about doing that are ultimate pieces of shit. don't be an ultimate piece of shit. um you know provide genuine value and you know just put out content and be useful. Um, that's my advice. I mean, I talk a lot about the, like one of the modules, if not two or three of them include content on building a YouTube audience, what's required, um, like all the basic stuff. So if you've got your mind around, I want to build an audience and, uh, like captivate people and then also sell them things later on down the road, there's stuff in the school of entrepreneurship that answers that as well. Plus, I'm doing monthly Zoom calls where you can legit come in on a Zoom and I'm sitting here opposite from the camera answering your questions. It's not live. It's offline. It's just part of the course. It's what I include in there, right? Climb Journey says, I run a healthy a health consultancy for four years with a consistent six-figure earning. How can I navigate company hierarchies to persuade decision makers to change? Uh, how can I navigate... So a health consultancy is a service-based business. How can I navigate company hierarchy? So you're selling a service to corporations to improve the health, I guess, of the staff or like as a bonus to the uh, corporation so they can keep staff? Like, I'm not sure what that is. Um, subscription revenue for service is the way to go. You want to offer them some kind of a, a subscription package that they pay you monthly and you know your ACH hits their credit card their account whatever on a monthly basis and you render the services um, that would be the best way to do it beyond that providing the services in an automated way would free up your time too right like for example like the school of entrepreneurship is on teachable I could very well, do one-on-one -on -one coaching with anybody that wanted to book me, which would take several hours of my time to repeat myself over and over again at a cost of probably 10 to $15,000 to explain everything that's in the course for two grand. Or I can explain everything that's in the course in a well-rehearsed scripted video sequence of videos, which is what the teachable courses are on the School of Entrepreneurship that anybody can watch at any given time, even while I'm asleep. I don't, I don't need to explain the material or preach it to them, they can watch it anywhere. So automating a lot of the things that you can automate, like for health conscious people, standard stuff, get your blood labs done, keep track of your blood pressure. You, you know, you show them how to do it. Like, you know, you can either get the machine yourself or when you're at the grocery store, here's a machine, here's how you use it. Like a lot of this stuff can be automated and put in video format that the corporation can subscribe to that they could make available to their employees uh, which is one of the elements that corporations need today to keep the golden handcuffs on people so they don't run off to the next corporation, right? So you're offering that incentive. Does that make sense? Like, I just connected the dots for you there, right? Um, there's a lot of stuff going on here, man. What about remote closing, selling high-ticket products? I get... I get DMs and emails from guys doing that too, right? Hey, Rich, you know, I can blow up your high ticket. They don't even fucking know what I sell. They don't even watch my videos. They just copy and paste this stuff to everybody. Like, I'll blow up your high ticket sales and I'll quadruple or quintuple your revenue or whatever. They, they have no idea what I do, right? They, they just don't, they don't pay attention to these things. And again, it's very competitive, right? That's, and I know it's competitive because I get DMs from this all the time. <clears throat> Dutch Brothers Coffee is a franchise I would recommend. Franchises suck. Stay away from franchises. I mean, you'll make good money, but they're just not the best use of your time, to be honest with you. Uh, I live in Colombia. I'm getting Unplugged Alpha Second Edition in Spanish. Awesome, dude. Enjoy. Make sure you leave a review. I know it's a little bit hard to find on Amazon because you have to like search in Spanish and probably English, but it's there. We're going to make some tweaks to uh, to fix that. Um, 
Dylan, do the no, I don't know what you're talking about there. I'm just going to stick with the super chats to get through these. I have self-studied genome editing for the last seven years. I am also getting my MBA right now. I want to launch a genetic editing startup. I don't know where to begin though. Should I jump right in? Um, you've studied it. I'm also getting my MBA right now. Dude, get the course. You've, you've probably spent close to 50 to a hundred thousand dollars on, on bullshit with the, uh, post-secondary schooling system, whether it's university or, or college for less than two grand, everything in the course explains all the stuff that you would need to contemplate to jump right in. Um, very, very simple answer to it, but it's the right answer. Ryan says, how do I decide what niche to target? How do I decide what type of business to build targeting that market? Your content's been very, that's a great question, Ryan. So it's very, very simple. Actually, there's three things that a business needs to do. So to target a certain niche or how do I decide it has to tick off these three things. And I'm gonna tell you what those are right now. One, you have to absolutely love doing it. You lose track of time when you're doing it. You start like for me, when I'm doing something, you know, involved in, uh, doing something, for my email list for my sales page on teachable, I'm writing a chapter in my book. It feels like, you know, maybe 30 minutes, you know, goes by, but time flies a lot faster. So one, you love what you're doing. You really do love what you're doing. Two, you're really good at it because you can love doing something, but suck at it. There's things that I love doing that I just suck at. And I know that it would never become a business. So again, one, love doing it. Two, you're good at it. And the third thing, most importantly, it has to make money. Because if you love doing something and you're really good at it, but it doesn't make money, you have a hobby. You don't have a business, right? So that's how you decide. So if you have business ideas, Ryan, and it's like, I have this idea and I have that idea and I have this, idea, just write them down on an Excel spreadsheet. And on one column, you know, you can assign a score to it. And in the other column, you know, you can put things like, do I need employees? Yes or no. Uh, do I have to comply with E and O regulations? Yes or no. Do, am I going to have the government up my ass because I'm like, you know, for example, if you're selling, uh, financial instruments or supplements or something like that, like nutraceutical, something that can hurt somebody physically, then the government will be up your ass to make sure that you comply with all regulations. So there's all these things that I talk about in the course material that help you identify a niche and create that type of business that will serve you. So long story short, buy the course, but those three things that I just mentioned there to you, love doing, good at, and it makes lots of money. Make sure you tick off all those boxes. And Jerry, the course is brimming with invaluable insights that will remain with you throughout your lifetime. I wholeheartedly endorse it. And Jer Jerry was one of the early adopters. He got into it when I first kicked it off uh, maybe a year or two ago. Um, there's been some updated material added. Again, every single month we have Zoom calls. I do Zoom calls every single month, twice a month, 90 minutes at a time. So there's loads and loads of uh, content there that either happens live, which is also recorded by the way, if you can't make it live, but it's all there. I'm going to start to wrap up because I got a lot of stuff to record tomorrow and I don't want to pooch my voice. Um, but let me just real quick go over what's in the course material. I'm going to share this up on the screen. Uh, you guys should be able to see this over here. So again, this is the landing page. This is what's called the landing page, by the way. Um, it's open for enrollment on November 1st, officially. It's open right now. You can click the link and you can enroll now if you want. But um, in the in the description below and pinned in the live chat, you can find that link. Uh, it's only open until November the 7th, so it's about a week sales period. I explained the problem with entrepreneurship, how the cheat codes to business are created, who I am, what I've done, who I've worked with, the learning events that I've done, everything that I've basically had to go, go through to get to where I'm at and learn all the skills that I've distilled in this course. Uh, the course curriculum is all broken down here. Um, there's a bunch of bonus episodes. Uh, some of these, you may see additions placed to this at a later date, but there's loads of stuff here. Anything from, I had a guy that has self-published over a thousand books, uh, provide a 45 minute webinar. Um, Amazon FBA, again, you know, there's a webinar in there, building audience on YouTube. There's two portions to that, well over an hour uh, and change in that. Sorry, it's uh, it's it's over 90 minutes of material on the YouTube stuff. Um, freelancing, Android development, crypto, blockchain, NFT gaming, how to keep your employees glued to business. So this one over here, by the way, somebody was asking about 
employees and how do I keep them tied in the business? And you guys already know it because I've spoken about it. I'm not a huge fan of having employees in your business, but if you must, you want to keep them handcuffed to your business as long as possible because it's very expensive and difficult to find good employees and then keep good employees because they will wander off, right? They're, uh, it's just the nature of the beast, right? There's always somebody out there that's going to compete for your staff, especially if they're top shelf, their name's going to get out there. So um, I put this 55 minute one together on keeping employees glued to your business. I was very good at that in my business when I ran it. Um, there's just all this, you know, social proof here. This is Kevin Harrington from, uh, uh, what's it called? Shark Tank, you know, down in the States. It was called uh, Dragons then up in Canada. Um, the community support element is included. Ignore this. It is open for enrollment right now. I got to change that bunch of testimonials. There's a video testimonial FAQs guys. Check it out. If you're on my email list, you'll get some notice of it in the uh, coming days when it kicks off on November the 1st. If you want to pay in crypto, by the way, uh, just email me back when you get the email notification. You'll get a $500 discount if you want to pay in crypto. Uh, aside from that, $19.97, one-time payment for life. You have access to everything into perpetuity. And every single month, there's two 90-minute uh, Zoom calls open Q and a, you can ask anything you want as it relates to your business. That being said, I'm going to wrap it up, call it a evening and, um, yeah, have a good night guys. All right, guys, if you enjoyed that podcast, make sure you visit my website at richcooper.ca to learn more about my courses, my book, the unplugged alpha community, or booking me for private coaching. Also, if you are a Canadian with $15,000 or more of credit card debt, and what you are doing right now isn't paying off the balances, then visit totaldebtfreedom.ca and hit get a free quote to see if you qualify to settle your credit card debt for less than you owe today over the next 48 months. Make sure you check out the top pinned comments